the Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. And with me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague, the hardest working man in show business, it's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? Welcome back, Big Rooster. I think it's the happiest I've ever been to see someone. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this week we look at the widening scandal around the CFMEU, we ask whether Andrew Forrest's green hydrogen dream is over, and we examine where the ASX goes next after breaking through 8,000 points for the first time. But first, Anthony, yes, it's great to be back, and a big thanks to you and our super producers, Alex Gow and Lap Fan, for holding the ship together while I was on leave. I did listen every week, Anthony, and, and I loved hearing Joe Aston and Tony Boyd and Vesna Poliak and Han- Hannah Wooten on the podcast. And I must say, I thought you had some really insightful questions too. So uh, well done, mate. Thank you. No, we got through it. Uh, what about yourself? How was the trip? Is uh, Europe as spectacular as it looks? Yeah, it is fantastic. We were in uh, uh, <laughs> Denmark and Sweden and a little stop in Tokyo on the way home. Lovely. Great time with the family and yeah. Uh, good to be back. A little bit colder in Melbourne than uh, it was mm. overseas, but that's that's life. Well, Anthony, I think we've got to start with the incredible historic event of the week, and we're only about two centimetres from catastrophic disaster. Yeah. That's exactly what happened on Sunday morning when someone took a pot shot at former US President Donald Trump. Thank goodness it missed because uh, the ramifications would have been truly ugly And obviously, we don't want to see that political violence in any democracy. But, Anthony, the wash up here, surely, is that Donald Trump is a shoe in for the White House, isn't he? As we record this podcast, uh, Donald Trump's going to accept the Republican nomination at the big Republican convention that's been going on for three days. Anthony, uh, who would you think would introduce the next president of the United States, as they like to say? Maybe... George W. Bush or a Republican luminary? Who was it? Hulk Hogan. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. what, what do you make of all this, though, Anthony? Is Trump home for all money now? Oh, look, I mean, we're 15,500 kilometres away here, James, and so it's hard to be <laughs> too close to it, but everything I see coming out of the States, you know, the markets podcasts I listen to, all the, the research look at in the morning, you know, it's, it's all coming up. Trump, isn't it? It's like a switch flicked yeah. two weeks ago, I think. You know, there was the debate, the assassination attempt. Now it's just one-way traffic, all Trump, and it's the whole narrative has gone from what could happen in the election to will the market rally or sell off when Trump gets in. Yeah. It's it's amazing how it's, it's flicked. But, I mean, overnight it looks like there's going to be news, more news around Joe Biden as well. Um, it's all moved very quickly in the past fortnight, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean the big change for me is the sense now that the Republicans can sweep in, mm. in November, that they can win the White House and win Congress. I think there was a sense that nobody would sweep, neither the Democrats or the Republicans would sweep. So if the Republicans can pull that off, it makes it a lot easier for them to push forward with this legislative agenda. And, you know, I think markets are happy to have the uncertainty around the election lift, but, geez, that legislative agenda could bring some uncertainty, you know, particularly here in Australia. Mm. If Trump follows through on the threat to whack China with massive tariffs, what sort of ramifications does that have for us down here if the Chinese economy sort of splutters and, and and really struggles even more than it is now. That, that's You think through some of these consequences, they might not be much fun. Oh, no, totally, James. But fortunately, you got welcomed back with a happier historic moment uh, this week with the ASX 200 crashing through 8,000 points on Monday, four and a half years after reaching 7,000 points. Now, I know these are only numbers, James, but the celebrations, they were a bit muted, weren't they? Yeah, sure were. Yeah. I, I don't know if you remember this, Anthony, but way, way, way back in uh, February 2007, yeah. the ASX hit 6,000 points, uh-huh. and I, I believe the AFR did six pages of coverage. <laughs> and on Monday when we hit 8,000, I think we had one new story, one column, and move on. <laughs> now, to me, that speaks to the fact that it's, it's different now, right? Mm. Well, 
A, the economy is in a weird spot where growth is slowing, but it doesn't look like the RBA can cut rates. And we had some employment data that was pretty strong on Thursday that backs up that case. We might even get a rate hike. And then on top of this, you've got this situation where a relatively small number of companies, stocks, in, in America, it's NVIDIA and the AI guys. In Australia, it's CBA, mm. Commonwealth Bank. They're the ones, you know, have pushed the pushed this rally. Everyone's worried about concentration. I, I think this is a bit of a, not, not a hated bull market rally, but it's, I don't sense any sort of jubilation out there amongst the fund managers and analysts I talk to. What, what about you, Anthony? I agree with you, James. I think you just touched on there what the Australian capital markets story of the year. It's not the 8,000 points. It's CBA's share price. CBA at <laughs> yes. 133 bucks this week. And, you know, this bank, it's our biggest, one of the world's most expensive. It just climbs higher and higher. And I remember an analysts and investors were having kittens when it went to $100 in 2021. And then, <laughs> and then the people were really losing the plot when it hit to 120 bucks in February this year. And, you know, and this week it climbs... It's now it's above 130, got as high as 133 and, and change. None of the big analysts are telling their clients to buy it. No. Fund managers are pretty much all underweighted, but they've been buying a bit of stock just to try and narrow those underweight positions. I think this is the Australian capital market story of the year. It tells so much about how equity markets have changed. Uh, you know, the passive money, active investors, the bets, yep. the big cap stocks, tech, it's Everything rolled into one. I've been thinking a lot about this this week. I've written about it today. I came across some research. There's a guy in the Arizona University, a professor called Hank Bessembinder, yeah. who I hadn't really heard of till this week. But he has done a lot of da- a lot of research over the last ten years, looking at stock market data, 1925 to the the modern day. And what he's found is that the gains in excess of what you might get of parking your money in bonds, Mm -hmm. the gains come from a very, 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 very small group of stocks, these extreme winners. So 4% of US stocks delivered all the gains, all the net gains over that period. You go to global stocks and it was only 1.8% of stocks that delivered the gains. So really this crowding into extreme winners is not a new phenomenon that There are a small number of companies that deliver you the big gains. Now, picking them, sticking with them, that's the hard bit. And when you think through it, that sounds surprising that there'd be such a small group of companies that really drive the market. Then you think about it, you think, well, hang on. It's a small group of companies that dominate lots of sectors. It's a small group of companies that have the wherewithal to continue to invest in their business, continue to grow, continue to make changes over very long periods of time. It's sort of logical that a relatively small number of businesses will do extremely well. They'll be extreme winners. And maybe that's what we're seeing with CBA. Everybody knows that this bank is just in a really strong position. Yeah, the fundamentals have got out of whack probably. And everyone, you know, is sort of looking at that and saying, hang on. And they're right to be cautious. But extreme winners keep winning. That's what the data says historically. And you know, I think it's a real dilemma for investors. Do you stick with the CBAs and the NVIDIAs that have got us here? Or do you say, oh, look, they look a bit stretched now. The fundamentals don't make sense. And you risk sort of going against history. I, I don't know. That That's a really tough one to, to play. Yeah, but how fortunate for so many Australians that bought shares in CBAs float 30 years ago. Yeah. That one of the big winners turned out to be one of the most widely held shares in the country. It's just such a good story. Very true. Well, Anthony, let's move to our first topic. And the Australian Financial Review's newsrooms have been buzzing around the country this week, thanks to a series of stories that we've done with the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and 60 Minutes, that have exposed the criminal infiltration of the construction division of the CFMEU. The fallout has frankly been breathtaking. The union's been placed in the hands of external administrators. Labor premiers and prime ministers and federal ministers are scrambling to escape the blast radius. And a raft of regulators are now being asked to explain how everybody missed this. Anthony, this is at once shocking and completely not a shock. Absolutely, James. I mean, first of all, hats off to our David Marin Guzman and, and the other reporters that have worked on this story. I mean, this is just been amazing. It's the most impactful story I think I've seen in my 
14 years at the AFR, the way they've been able to roll out like new information after new information. I think the story's onto its seventh day. Yeah. And this morning I thought it was probably one of the most explosive ones of the lot. It's um, fearless reporting, uh, tough subject. Is it shocking? Well, I'm shocked. I'm shocked by the extent of the evidence. I'm shocked that we're into the seventh day, like I said, and there's still this new stuff coming out. I'm shocked by the level of sourcing, the tapes, the recorded conversations, the footage. Am I shocked that criminality is at the heart of the CFMEU as as shown by these stories? I mean, no. I mean, look at the iconography around the CFMEU. It looks, the logos, the clothing, the jumpers, the shirts, the flags, it, it looks like an out-at-law motorcycle gang. I don't know if you saw, there was a great opinion piece in the paper this morning by Roger Giles, an 85-year-old former judge, and he oversaw a Royal Commission into New South Wales's building industry in the early 90s, hmm. and there's, it said there's been two similar Royal Commissions since, all of which has exposed this lawlessness before, yet it continues. Yeah. James, you're in Melbourne, which is the epicentre of this scandal. For those not in Victoria, tell us a little bit about how this has been allowed to happen. Well... If you're not in Victoria, you might not have heard of this program that the Andrews government, now the Allen government, has been running for the best part of a decade. It's called the Big Build. Okay. They've poured $100 billion into lots of different infrastructure projects around the state. We've had a big focus on removing level crossings, train Mm -hmm. level crossings. Hey, good idea. If you want to improve productivity at a grassroots level, make the roads flow better. You know, we, we've had a big focus on road projects. There's a, a huge one at the moment called the Northeast Link, which is, you know, dots half the city. There's uh, a, another one to build that Transurban's involved in building um, the Westgate Tunnel. So we've all known that these projects are happening. Hey, it's it's helped Labor here win three elections. That People like infrastructure. They like the idea that the state is on the move and growing. But... The problem is massive amounts of money, a big sort of honeypot often attracts the wrong type of bees. And that's exactly what we've seen here. Mm. The CFMEU has been able to get a lot of influence over who the winners and losers from that big spend are. They've been able to direct which companies get work, how wages and conditions are set. And that has attracted nefarious elements. It's clear that that has brought Bikey gangs and other criminal elements are wanting a slice of that big pie. And you might think, well, you know, bit of wastage of money, that's okay. But the story that really shocked me this week, Anthony, was the story of a, of a 19-year-old kid who suffered a, an accidental overdose. And it turned out that he had been bullied on a CFMEU worksite for wearing the wrong T-shirt. Yeah, far out. You know, a T-shirt associated with a, a company that wasn't CFMEU affiliated. And he had been locked in a shed for hours, bullied, told to, you know, get stuffed, made to feel like, you know, a piece of dirt over a T-shirt, a 19-year-old kid. Mm. I mean, y- you see that and you think, what on earth is going on? The money, okay, taxpayer money gets wasted all the time, but you can't have a culture that allows that. And I think what we've seen this week, Anthony, is this is a really tough one for Labor governments. I mean, if this was Coles or Woolworths or Qantas, politicians would be falling over themselves to call parliamentary inquiries. We would have 25 parliamentary inquiries by now. (laughs) But Labor's stuck because the party's taken plenty in donations from the CFMEU. There are plenty of politicians, as we saw in today's reporting, who have publicly and privately supported the former the CFMEU boss, John Sector. They're really wedged here, aren't they? Oh, you're right, James. Labor's so quick to call a corporate inquiry to, to bag core corporate behaviour. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but they are. And here we are with an organisation that is very central to the Labor movement. It's very central to the party politics that appears to be so rotten to the core that it had to be put in someone else's hands this week. I mean, yeah, like you say, where's the judicial inquiry? The call for the Royal Commission, the the really damning words. And the other irony here, the other group that's really good at bashing corporates and calling for inquiries are the unions themselves. Well, you know, it turns out their high horses were more like Shetland ponies. You know, they're, uh, <laughs> they're just, it's just an absolute fantasy, isn't it? I mean, because look at one of your own, look at the disgusting behavior that's going on and, that's the very sad thing. 
about this story, right? The CFMEU, it's so, at its core, it's got such an important job to play. You yeah. know, the workers, right, pay, particularly the safety side. I mean, yes, it doesn't absolutely. matter whether you lean left or right. I mean, everyone, everyone surely can understand the important role it should play on these big construction projects, but it just isn't. It's just rotten. And, you know, the failings here are catastrophic. Yeah, yeah. James, you wrote about the potential spillover for the superannuation sector. Something is very much in our home patch. So you've got CBUS, which is the $85 billion industry super fund that has three current or former CFMEUs officials on its board. What do you think should happen there? Well, look, it's difficult. I mean, I think CBUS is under some real pressure. The, the chairman there is Wayne Swan, the former treasurer. Mm. If this was a corporate board, and we've seen this recently, we, we've seen people who are on the board of Qantas, for example, receive recommendations against their elections at other boards just because they were part of the Qantas oversight. Now, if you apply those same principles to the CBUS board, it's hard to see how those CFMEU officials can continue on the board. But the way these boards are structured is that there's a certain amount of delegates from the unions, a certain amount of delegates from the employer groups, and in the case of CBUS, two independent directors. But there's a strong argument, and I've heard it this week from several people, that, hey, the governance structure that's in place at Industry Super has worked well. Look at the performance. I get that. The Industry super sector is unquestionably the strength of the Australian super sector. You look at the, the the Chant West table of the best 10 performing super funds over the last 10 years, they are all industry funds. It's yeah. hard to argue, yeah. right? But look at the Banking Royal Commission, which is an, an area where the industry super funds really pushed hard for boards to improve their corporate governance. Now, in the couple of years before the Banking Royal Commission, everything looked all right at the banks too. Yeah. Their performance was great. Their profits were massive. Share prices were on fire. But it turned out that beneath that, the governance had to be improved. And I look at this and I say, look, maybe maybe the governance is as good as it gets, but let's ask the question. Let's be open to improving the governance. There's massive amounts of money involved, $85 billion in the case of CBUS and you know up to 150 at some other big industry funds. So I just reckon... Ask the question, do the work, be committed to constant improvement like the industry funds want corporates to be. I'm with you on that one, James. I mean, I don't, I don't think the CBUS is the heart of this story. Obviously, the CFMEU is, but yeah. if there can be some sort of lasting change around the, the governance of the industry funds, then I'm all for it. Because I think, you know, the industry funds have been great at the end of the day. For Australians, for their customers or members, as they call them, they've, like you say, the returns have, have done well. But that doesn't mean they can't be better. That doesn't mean they can't be run better. Yeah. And I think you know, if if we could use this as a window to push for change and get change, get better, long term, sustainable returns for their members, then mate, sounds good for me. Where, where do you think the scandal goes next, Anthony? The way we normally do things is we'd be banging on the table and calling for a proper inquiry, right? We've seen it yes. time and time again when um, Nick McKenzie, God bless him, from the age in the Sydney Morning Herald gets on 60 Minutes and goes after a uh, uh, crown or a star or now the CFMEU. Normally, his reporting you know, is 1% of what's going on, but it blows it all open. Then the inquiry comes in. Yeah. We get to see all the decision makers in full view face up to the um, some short pitch bowling, and we sort of get a better picture of what's going on. But in this, but this, the judge that was in the paper this morning, Roger Giles, is in my head telling telling me that we've had three of these inquiries now, and we haven't got the lasting changes we need. So I'm not sure how we bridge that gap, but I reckon let's get some more sunlight in this thing. We, the inquiry would be a good thing, but it's what it's what happens after that that matters, isn't it? Well, I think you're right, uh, but but I reckon there's a group that we haven't heard much about yet, mm. Anthony, and that and they are going to be eventually come on, in, into focus. That's the construction companies that have sort of accepted that you need to play by the CFMEU's rules mm. and have effectively been part of this problem. I think there's going to be some heat on them. Why did you just roll over and say, yeah, that guy might be a bikey, but oh, I guess it's okay. I think I think there will be some big questions asked there. I mean, it, 
in this case, it takes two or more to tango and building industry heavyweights will be sitting there this week saying, oh, how soon are we going to be put under the spotlight? But let's wait and see. Well, James, things are never boring in the world of billionaire Andrew Forrest, the executive chairman of Iron Ore Giant Fortescue. But this week, Forrest made a major announcement about the future of the company. Now, for five years, James Forrest has been sketching out an ambitious plan for Fortescue to become the world's leading producer of green hydrogen, as well as a major force in iron ore. Forrest has been a real evangelist for green hydrogen, but on Wednesday, he announced his dream has collided with reality, and the goal of producing 15 million tonnes of green hydrogen a year has been put on the back burner. James, why has he taken this decision? Well, Anthony, I think Forrest has had to accept that he was early. Now, sometimes that's the same as being wrong, but mm. he he wants he had wanted to get to 15 million tonnes of green hydrogen by 2030. It's just clear that the world's not ready for that. Yeah. Not nearly ready. As Forrest himself puts it, what you need to make green hydrogen is lots of cheap green energy. And because this transition has been splattering in, in the last few years, there's not enough green energy to make the green hydrogen that he wants to make. So he has taken what is a financially responsible decision to pull back from those green hydrogen ambitions and focus on bringing more green electricity to market where he should be able to make money, whether he should be able to earn an economic return. So look, for me, he's managed to make the right decision. I think probably it's a bit personally disappointing, Mm -hmm. but this is the reality and this is shareholder money at the end of the day and he's, he's got to use it responsibly. Yeah, James, you spoke to Forrest on Wednesday, which was the big day of the announcement. He's a naturally very positive person. Was he upbeat about this? I don't think upbeat would be the the right way. I mean, he's always upbeat, I guess. He's always selling, uh, isn't he? Yeah, he always he sees this as an evolution rather than a disappointment, I guess. But, uh, yeah, he would say that. But, look, I think he's personally disappointed that, you know, he calls them the weenies in the uh, fossil fuel sector and in, and in politics haven't realised that we need to move faster in this energy transition. And But by the same token, I, I think he's playing the long game. He's trying to build a Fortescue's green energy, green metals, green technology business over decades. And I think he's willing to accept that there's going to be bumps in the road. I mean... Let's face it, there's some bumps in the road for Fortescue stuff. 700 of them uh, were made redundant on Wednesday as as Fortescue bought together the sort of back office functions across its energy business and its mining business and and sort of ran them together. But again, Forrest sort of sees that as the evolution. He says we had to start the energy business as a startup with its own infrastructure. Now it's grown into a you know, living thing, we can bring it together with with the, the main part of Fortescue, the, the mining part. So, look, he's an upbeat guy, natural-born optimist, and, you know, frankly, the world needs those type of guys <laughs> to a certain extent. You, you, you need people who are, you know, a bit like a, they can bounce back from, from almost whatever. But, Anthony, how'd the market react to this? Because investors have been a bit sceptical about this green hydrogen plan, it's fair to say. So did they like what they heard from from Forrest on Wednesday? I thought they'd love it. I thought there's three big concerns that hang over Fortescue. You've got China and the price of iron ore. You've got the way it's spending in those iron ore cash flows on things like the energy. And then you've got governance. I thought I thought this would ease the second of those three big concerns and the shares would, would fly. But I was 100% wrong. <laughs> it, it, I got it completely wrong. The, share, the shares were lower on Thursday and... I mean, the way I read Fortescue's move here was I thought this was Forrest admitting that, well, look at the job cuts bit, right? I thought it was Forrest admitting that Fortescue had got a bit corporate heavy. It was a bit too much like BHP or Woodside, you know, the big Aussie corporates that he, he sort of despises, right? This is a guy who's a disruptor. Yeah. He does things his ways and he's been successful by pushing back against the conventions that a normal BHP or a Woodside or whatever would do. So I thought he was trying to make Fortescue leaner and meaner again. And I th- I thought the market had liked that. I thought that's one of the things Fortescue is known for. Yeah. Being a lean and mean model, you know, it's it's a company of conviction. It's great at developing projects and it 
it's great at sticking it to the doubters. <laughs> so I thought this was Fortescue getting back closer to its roots because before this green stuff came along, James, like Fortescue was on fire. I went back and looked at the numbers. So in 2019, it, it was just an iron ore miner, right? Yeah. And it made an extra $5 billion of revenue that year, had a good year. Now, 43 of that $5 billion, so nearly every dollar, ended up down in the earnings line, right? It just it just doubled wow. its earnings margins in one year. And that's because it was it had been well set up, it had good infrastructure, and it was a lean, mean profit machine. <laughs> right. And then then the green energy stuff comes along, it starts investing in that, and investors were a little bit worried that, you know, it might be wasting some of those those cash flows. But um anyway, despite all that, the shares were down. The supporters were saying it was because of the school holidays and the analysts are not around and people weren't paying attention. Right. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> to, to me, to me, I think maybe the announcement just didn't address the big fears, which are, you know, the iron ore price, the governance, and it's yeah. also kicked the can down the road on this green hydrogen rather than uh, doing something dramatic. But what sort of feedback did you get on it, James? Yeah, no, not a lot, but I, I think you're, uh, yeah, I, I, you're right. I don't think it sort of went off with the bang that I was expecting yeah. either. I, I thought this was I, I called it the biggest shake up at Fortescue in several years <laughs> and no one seemed to agree with me. But I, I don't think I don't think I'm wrong. I don't, I don't we don't need outside validation here. Well, sometimes it helps. <laughs> sometimes it helps, true. But look, there's a bit going on, isn't there, in the sector. I mean, we saw Nickel West uh BHP sh- shut down its Nickel West project last week. Lithium's on the skids, seven hundred redundancies at Fortescue. I mean this is a tough little period for mining. As you say, the iron ore price is under some pressure. There's doubts over China's economy. It's not easy to love for resources at the moment. In fact, coming back to your CBA point, that's part of the reason I think we're seeing this CBA shares so strong because people are getting out of the big miners mm. and getting into the safety of BHP. So, Anthony... Will Fortescue ever realise its green hydrogen dream? Is just on the back burner, as Forrest says, or is it fading? Good question, James. Um, I mean, betting against Twiggy Forrest has been a poor idea. Yeah. Even for those that were late to the Fortescue story, I mean, just say you invested this time in four years ago, 2019. You put in twenty thousand dollars, you'd now have eighty thousand dollars of shares and dividends. So, I mean, it, it's been a, it's been a good trade, but I, I don't I don't know if this works or not, though. Um, at the end of the day, there just isn't a customer for the green hydrogen yet. And that's the concerning bit. Yep. I mean, the way that Andrew Forrest works, and it was the same as same on the iron ore side. He found the customer and then he, he found a way to sell them the product and then he got the product to them, right? So, so while we're all focused on the projects, the green hydrogen projects, you can bet they're trying to find customers that will underwrite those projects, right? That will agree to yep. buy the green hydrogen at a certain price. It hasn't been able to find them yet. May, maybe in the future the market develops. Maybe it, it'll just take an extra, you know, d- decade than what what he was hoping. But I mean, we're seeing Woodside's gone down this path as well and come to the same conclusion. It hasn't been able to sign the customers it needs for the green hydrogen out of its project in the US. So it's certainly looking doubtful. The, the one thing I'd say, Anthony, is that we, as a planet, we probably need to hope that Forrest does eventually realise his green hydrogen dream. We do need a way to get emissions out of heavy industry, out of things like shipping and trucking and, you know, big manufacturing, heavy manufacturing. Hydrogen might be it, maybe it's something else, but we need some way to, to reduce emissions in these areas for the sake of the planet. So let's hope he's right in a way. Big power lines and batteries aren't going to help on ships, are they? No, that's exactly right. All right, Anthony, let's come back after the break. We've got a really interesting question about ANZ's share price. Well, welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Friday, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. All right, Anthony, a lot of the attention's offshore at the start of next week. We've got on Tuesday, US time, we've got earnings from three 
really big dogs, Microsoft, Tesla, and Alphabet, which of course owns Google. Uh, a bit of interest on Thursday locally from Macquarie, who have their AGM. We usually get a first quarter trading update. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about how their big commodities trading business is going and, and I guess their banking division and, and, and that sort of thing. And then on Friday, an interesting data point, Anthony, Australian retail sales. We saw, as we mentioned earlier, the labor market figures, the, the jobs market's still pretty strong. There's still a sense we might need a rate hike. Geez, we're coming up to this quarterly CPI figure on July 31. I've probably said this before, but can you remember a more important data release than this one? Yeah, it's certainly very important. I mean, it's it's important for the economy. It's important for Australian politics as well. And all these little points we're getting along the way. And retail sales is one next week. Unemployment was one this week. They're all just leading up to that big CPI number at the end of the month. Yeah. Well, Anthony, we love questions on the Chanticleer podcast, particularly when they're from Australia rather than some clown overseas. <laughs> uh, and this week, we've got a great question from John from Tasmania. If you've got a question you want to send in, you can email us at chanticleer at afr.com. You can also send us a question in audio form. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from, and email it to us. And that's exactly what John's done. Hey, Chanticleer, this is Jono from Hobart, and I've got a question about the ANZ share price. Why does it never go up? I seem to remember buying ANZ shares in the mid 90s for 1850, about there. They did that float a while ago where they sold shares for 1850, and I thought, well, enough's enough. So I sent an email. Uh, I pretty simply said, why doesn't your share price ever go up? And I got a response which uh, was very, very, very defensive. It's either got to be their, their dividend policy or uh, their approach to capital management or incompetence. See if you can come up with an answer. I'd be interested to hear what you've got to say. Cheers. Jono. All right, Anthony. Uh, Paul O'Sullivan and Shane Elliott at ANZ <laughs> might, might look for a visitor from the Apple Isle at their next AGM um, of uh, a slightly disgruntled Jono. Um I did some numbers, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Over the last five years, the ANZ share price is up nine and nine percent and change versus a market up eight and a half percent. Over the last ten years, the ANZ share price is down ten percent against a market up forty three percent. We should note that there's lots of dividends in there. But does Jono have a point here? Jono's definitely got a point. Uh, if if you include dividends over those ten years, James, you, you're up about nearly 10% a year at ANZ, okay? So the, while the share price, Jono, looks like it may not have moved, once you include dividends, and and I think it's fair to include dividends, yeah. then you, you're probably doing better than you realize. Now, ANZ up 10%. Um, I mean, that sounds good. That's about what the market's done. But the problem, Jono, is, is that it's really trailed CBA. It's trailed NAB as well. So CBA, I think, it's done about 16% a year. NAB about 14% a year in the past 10 years. So... If you look at it, ANZ's a laggard compared to those two. It's going slightly better than Westpac. So the question is, why is it a laggard? Why is it significantly underperformed CBA and NAB? And James, we could do a year's worth of podcasts on the <laughs> banks, their strategies, their leadership, how they're, how they're similar, how they're different. But I think Jono might find that a bit boring. At this, at what, he asked a really simple question. It's a great question. And and if I had to come up with a simple answer for you, Jono, I would say it's respect for shareholders' capital. ANZ has, you know, including over that 10-year period, it's been a heavy issuer and buyer of its own shares. It raised equity in August 2022 to buy Suncorp. It raised equity in 2015 to meet its tighter capital requirements at a time that all the banks did. But basically in the past 10 years, it's got an extra 10 or 15% of shares on issue. Now that's an extra 10 or 15% that you have to attribute profits to every year, that you have to pay dividends to every year. And while that doesn't sound like much, it all adds up. And that yeah. capital discipline is, that's the, I mean, that's the secret of CBA's success. We don't, well, one of the secrets of its success, we don't give it that much attention, but it's incredibly disciplined around shares, is, share issues, buyback, capital management. And, and while it might only look like little fractions at the time, it all adds up. And it just comes back to a respect for shareholders' funds, I think. And and in my opinion, that's that's the core difference. 
Yeah, that, that's a great answer, Anthony. I guess we should note that part of the capital they've raised in recent years has been for the uh, acquisition of Suncorp's banking division. Mm-hmm. So to your point, it just shows how much sort of pressure is on ANZ to really, really, really make that deal work. And the history of big mergers is pretty patry. Uh, so let, let's see how they go. Maybe uh, Jono will be asking questions at AGMs for a while to come. Yeah, but it, so it raised equity in 2022, James, to buy Suncorp Bank. It's taken two years and it's only due to buy the bank, you know, at the end of this month. Meanwhile, it's got too much capital and it's buying back shares. So that's what I mean. It's just that roller coaster ride of yeah. share issuance, buyback, issuance, buyback. And you tend to, you just the way these things work, you tend to raise when the when the price is low and you need capital and you tend to buy back when you're going really well and the share price is high. Now, that sounds like it's good for shareholders because you're buying cheap shares and they're buying them back off you when they're expensive, but it's actually not good for the not good for the bank and it's um, not good for its capital discipline. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Anthony, uh, another big week looms. We'll wait to see where the CFMEU scandal goes. We'll look to see where US politics goes. Could be a big week there. And uh, some important corporate news around too. So look forward to joining you next week, mate. Good to be back. Great to have you back, James. We'll see you next week. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at afr.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson, and Anthony McDonald, and it was produced by Alex Gow and Lapfan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.